Hello and welcome into BTN's Take 10 Podcast. This is Alex Rue of BTN.com. We are back after a week off. We took a week off for Thanksgiving and, you know, just kind of let everyone chill out, have some turkey, spend some time with family. And, uh, you know, I find myself during Thanksgiving week falling behind on podcasts. And last week, episode didn't really come together. So we punted and we got a great episode for you this week leading into huge weekend college football and of course a huge weekend in the big 10 with the big 10 championship game coming up ohio state demolished michigan this past weekend meaning they were the representatives out of the east to meet northwestern from the west uh coming up in indianapolis so we structured this episode around that game and we got some really great guests to talk about the game and uh provide what i think is some really relevant commentary as we move toward uh, the showdown between Ohio State and Northwestern. So what we got coming up is three separate interviews. Uh, we got two guests that aren't you know, normally on week in and week out, and one guest that is. Uh, we wrap up with a, a stat head segment with Harold Shelton. He's on every week. But first, we have a pair of outside interviews, one heavily focused on Northwestern and one focused more on the game itself. We'll lead off with more of a preview of the game itself and, and kind of a... Uh, Season recap is included as well, and that discussion is with BTN lead studio host Dave Revson. Dave's been on the show once before. I was excited to welcome him back. Uh, Dave did go to Northwestern as a student, but obviously has been around the Big Ten for many years. Uh, has been the lead studio host for 11 years and the entire existence of BTN. So he was able to provide a great perspective on the season, on Ohio State, on Northwestern, and just everything that kind of encompasses this weekend coming up here in Indianapolis and uh, got into a lot of in-depth topics and interesting discussions with him, including uh, Ohio State's college football playoff positioning, why Ohio State has had such a kind of strange season, what this path and season means for Northwestern athletics as a whole and the season uh, on its own. And we also at the end touched on where Michigan goes from here after getting beat down by the Buckeyes again. So a lot of stuff with Dave right off the bat, and then we get to an uh, interview with another Northwestern grad. This second interview is actually much more focused on the Wildcats because the guest is a very high-profile and front-facing figure for that university, and it is J.A. Adande. Uh, the name, if you're a sports fan, I'm sure rings a bell. He was prominent at ESPN for many years, was a regular on Around the Horn, and pardon the interruption, and was a writer there as well covering the NBA and many other topics uh, for quite a while at ESPN before leaving in the past couple of years to be the full-time director of sports journalism at Northwestern University. So really interesting discussion with J.A. after our talk with Dave. Uh, J.A. called in for about 20 minutes and we talked about his exit from ESPN, his current role in the academic world, uh, running the sports journalism department at Northwestern, and then we got his opinion on Northwestern football and the game this weekend. So a lot of interesting tidbits in, in the discussion with J.A. Adande as well. I uh, talked some around the horn, some PTI, and like I said, plenty of Northwestern Wildcats. So a couple of great guests, and then our regular, uh, you know, he's almost a co-host at this point, Harold Shelton, uh, a, a regular stat head segment with him to close things out on our return to the airwaves here on the Take 10 podcast. So we will get to those interviews in just a second. We'll lead off with Dave. But first, I want to relay a message from our sponsor, and this is especially valuable for anyone out there listening who might be interested in a career in sports, uh, You know, working at a place like BTN, working anywhere in the sports field. This is for you. If you've ever thought about a career in sports, check out the master's program in sports administration at Northwestern University. You can build your skill set and your network in evening or online classes. Find out more at sps.northwestern.edu slash sports. All right, like I said, great opportunity there. And now before we get to Dave Revson, just one more reminder that you can download and find the Take 10 podcast on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Podbean, or YouTube. You can, you can subscribe on any of those platforms if you're listening and streaming right now and you, and you want to download the show listen to it regularly, check out Take 10 Podcasts on those platforms. All right, with those reminders out of the way, we'll get to our first guest. 
Like I said, it's BTN lead studio analyst Dave Rebson. Talk plenty of Big Ten championship game, plenty of college football, and a lot of uh, just overall solid, in-depth sports talk that uh, you won't want to miss ahead of this weekend's game. Here he is. It's BTN's Dave Rebson. Very pleased to welcome back Dave Revs into the show. This is BTN's lead studio analyst, and he's joining me during a very busy time of year, so I appreciate that. Dave, how are you doing today? I am wonderful. Good to be here, Alex. All right. Thanks for joining me, like I said. And uh, for this Champ Game edition of the podcast, I want to focus on that quite a bit. But before we even get into that, I want to address just the season as a whole. And as we reflect on, on the regular season now that we are uh, in Champ Week, I just want to get your thoughts on the regular season and kind of how it played out is definitely a unique one from uh, you know a fan and media standpoint, I think. Yeah, it was. I mean, I don't think the league was nearly as good as people thought that it would be, including myself, I guess. Um, I, I really felt like, you know, particularly some of the teams, well, I guess you'd go to both divisions, frankly, where there were teams that I thought would be better than they were. I'd probably count Penn State among them coming out of the tour. They've certainly had a fine year, but not nearly at the level that I thought. I I didn't necessarily anticipate Michigan State being as poor offensively as they were, but I did not come away all that impressed from the tour, so that that one didn't really shock me. And then in the West, I I think it was pretty apparent to to Jerry and Howard and me when we left Wisconsin that they were not head and shoulders above the rest of the division as we felt they were the year before, but I'm surprised that that it went as far south as it did for them. So, um, yeah, I mean, probably more underachievers than overachievers. I mean, I just think you have to be honest, and, and that's what the league was this year. I, I thought it was different last year, but still some really good storylines. So when you consider the coaching drama we saw at, at multiple campuses, the representative we have in Indy that went winless and non-conference, I'm not sure we'll see another season like it, or at least it's something that we certainly didn't see coming, I don't think, uh, back in August. No, I, I mean, I, I think I'm surprised uh, – to a certain extent, um, I, I thought Northwestern was one of the better teams that we saw in sure. the West. So, I mean, I know like that narrative of they didn't win a non-conference game. I get it. Um, you know, we can get it. Well, obviously, we'll get into Northwestern. But I think they are a worthy representative. I mean, they played every team in the West and beat every single one of them. So, you know, again, I, I understand the non-conference versus conference. But you're in a division. You play them all. You beat them all. You deserve to to play for the championship, and and on top of that, be two of the three teams they played from the East. But yeah, I mean, I do think there was a lot of drama involved this year. I mean, starting with Ohio State in the off season and Maryland, it was a strange year for the Big Ten. I don't think there's any avoiding it. Yeah, and do you think too much is being made of Northwestern going winless in the non conference? I mean, like you said, they won the games in. Uh, outside the division, and they've won 15 and 16 if you look back to, to previous years. So you think too much is being made of that narrative as far as uh, the strength schedule and the non-conference schedule goes? I do think too much is being made of it. I mean, if you watch the Akron game, look, I know they lost to Akron. They were winning 28-3 to at halftime. They had a quarterback playing on one leg who turned the ball over three times, all three which led to touchdowns for Akron. Again, I, there's no excuse for losing that game, but I just feel people are so caught up in that narrative that, again, like – who else should go? <laughs> you know, they're in a division with six other teams. They beat every single one of them. Uh, Michigan, they were beating 17 to nothing. Obviously, let the game slip away. Notre Dame, had they come up with a fourth down stop, they would have had the ball with a chance to win the game or move ahead in the fourth quarter against a team that won undefeated. So I think they're a, a worthy representative. And, you know, again, I mean, if you look at the other side, I mean, get, you know, if you're saying, well, there are better teams out there, who? I mean, maybe Penn State, I guess. Penn State's ranked higher by the committee. I mean, do we want to see Michigan against Ohio State again? Like, that certainly wouldn't make sense. I think Ohio State has proven they're the superior team. Right. So, you know, I guess I, I think what's bothering me a little bit is it feels like from the national perspective, people are kind of using Northwestern. I kind of, I don't want to say hating on Northwestern, but like, Look, they did what they were supposed to do, right? I mean, they won all their games against their division. And, um, you know, like, if you're going to blame people, blame the rest of the teams for for not being able to beat them because no one did. Right, and they're the 19th ranked team in the country. That's not out of the ordinary for matchups and conference title games. No, again, there are two other ones where it's roughly about the same, right? I mean, it's, you know, roughly about the same place that Pitt is. Pitt's not going to be ranked. Roughly about the same place that Utah is, so... You know, again, I mean, this is just kind of the, the way that it works. So it has been interesting to to me to see that. And, again, I, I just feel like people are are putting it on them when, you know, put it on Iowa for not having a better season. Put it on 
Wisconsin or Nebraska or whoever it is. But Northwestern did what they were supposed to do. They beat every team in their division. All right. So you're a college football historian. Can you kind of put this accomplishment into perspective uh, from a broader view? For, for those who might not be familiar you know, with Northwestern athletics of the past, uh, especially since you walked that campus, can you put into perspective how far just the program has come? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a big accomplishment for them, but they've been a really good football program now. I mean, a very representative football program for the last, you know, nearly 25 years. I mean, since 1995. You know, what's interesting is, uh, I don't know if you follow, like, the Bill Connolly S&P Plus stuff, Mm -hmm. but he had an article where two weeks ago he said it was the worst Northwestern team in seven years. Really? By his ranking. So, you know, it's not like they've reached some pinnacle. I don't think this is – I think Northwestern's team last year would have beaten – their team this year. I think that was a better team. They certainly, you know, were they had a great running back. Um, probably were a little bit better at, at wide receiver, probably a little bit better on defense. So um, I don't think like that this is some sort of breakthrough for them. I think, you know, you put them up head to head with Iowa, Wisconsin, Michigan State. I think they're 500 or better in all of those series under Pat Fitzgerald. So you know, they've been a representative program for quite some time. They're not Michigan, they're not Ohio State, but they're one of the solid teams in in the Big Ten. Sure. So speaking with this about this team specifically, why do you think it seems to kind of play up or down to the competition? I mean, you mentioned the Akron game. We saw the Rutgers game was close. Yeah. Uh, they lost to Duke, but they've been competitive in the games they've lost to teams that might have more talent. And you know, like I said, they've won fifteen and sixteen Big Ten games, and, and a lot of these games have been close. So why do you think that they're able to play to level of competition, both you know, good and bad? I don't know. I think it's a really good question. I mean, I do think, look, I think it's fair to look at them and say they barely beat Rutgers. I mean, I think the Illinois game is a little different because they (laughs) they basically Mm -hmm. had their their second string in for most of the game. But but I do think it's fair to look at them and say, like, this is not an overpowering team, right? That that is clearly true. And in in talking about this kind of discussion of how good are they or or aren't they, I mean, I think that's a, a perfectly valid point to make. As to why it happens, the one thing I will say is I think Pat Fitzgerald comes into every game saying, how can we come out? I mean, this is going to sound stupid when I say this, but but hear me out. How can we come out with at least one more point than the other team? Like, I think he is acutely aware that that is the goal of the game, right? It's not to impress with style points. It's not to try to play outside of who you are. It's how can we put together a game plan that gives us the best chance of emerging with more points than the other team. And so I think they come in each time with a slightly different plan. That is, I mean, obviously every team comes up with a different plan, but you're oriented around kind of how can we be a little bit better than this opponent. Now, they don't have much margin for error, clearly, but they have done an unbelievable job of winning one-score games, and that's really been for a long time. I mean, that's not just this year and last year. That's really been kind of throughout the time that, that Fitz has been at Northwestern. So to me, I think that's part of what makes him a, a really good coach is, is kind of this idea of, hey, we're going to come into this thing and we're going to figure out a way to win. And we don't care what it looks like as long as we win. So to me, that explains some of the lesser performances. How does it explain, you know, the, the Michigan game being up 17 to nothing? How does it explain really having every chance out there to, to beat Notre Dame, even though they didn't come through and do it. You know, I mean, I think they have some pretty good guys. You know, I, I, one of the things that they do is they retain players. Players don't leave. Players all graduate. So they, they are almost always an older, more experienced team. And that's worth something. So where they might not have quite the talent in terms of four- and five-star recruits, I think they make up with it with, for it with the continuity, and, and maybe that explains why they're able to to play closer games. Right. So the inverse of that, I'm, I'm glad you brought up those motivational tactics and his game plans, because the inverse of that uh, is Ohio State that seems to be a really boomer bust team. We've seen over the last couple of years where they just don't show up and they get their doors blown off. And yeah. then some games like this past weekend when they, you know, beat the brakes off of, of Michigan and, and the true talent, I think, shines through. Do you think kind of the inverse is at play here where you've got a lot of turnover, a lot of draft picks, um, year after year going to the NFL and guys that you know might not be as motivated week in or week out do you think that's at play or because that's kind of I think my take on it is that uh, you have a very talented team in Ohio State year after year but I think we've seen them you know maybe not get up for games at the same intensity level as others I think there is something to that I mean I have I have sat there and kind of scratched my head this year trying to figure out what's going on because 
because I left that campus in Columbus convinced that that was the most talented team in the league. Now, I didn't think there was a huge gap between them and Michigan. I thought Michigan was really, really good when we went there, and I thought it's in some areas maybe better than Ohio State. But across the board, kind of on average, take the average starter and, and kind of weigh them on some sort of talent continuum, and Ohio State is, is the best team in the league. So why do they have one game a year where they go to Iowa and lose or where they get blown out by Purdue? And I don't know. You know, your, your guess is as good as mine. Or why do they need to go to overtime against Maryland? I don't know. Is it motivation? Is it guys thinking about the NFL? Is it the lack of continuity and losing – superstars each year and guys roles changing dramatically you know all those things are possible but you know in fairness Clemson hasn't done that this year Alabama hasn't done that this year I mean they've won other every game by more than 20 points has been done since Yale in 1888 right I mean Alabama's got the same group of guys looking to get to the NFL in the same way Ohio State is so I don't know why Ohio State kind of seems to stumble every year and and have one or two games like that um it, you know, it could end up costing them. I mean, I guess we'll we'll kind of see what happens here. But I can't, I can't account for it. It just, for whatever reason, there just seems to be a game or two every year that they're not ready to go. All right. So how do you put their season, I guess, into context? Uh, you, you kind of got to it there a little bit, but it's been so unconventional from you know the the coaching drama in, in the early season to some close calls with Indiana, kind of Minnesota, definitely inferior teams, and then obviously getting destroyed by. Purdue and then closing it out, closing the regular season out with a, a blowout uh, of their rival Michigan. So when you look back, you know, a lot of ups and downs, peaks and valleys, but here they are, 11 and 1. So how do you, at this point, heading into Indy, put that Ohio State season into context right now? I don't know. I think it kind of depends what they do in Indy. I, I feel like they finally, for the first game all year, I remember we went off the air on the pregame show Saturday. And uh, I, I want to say Howard picked Ohio State, and I essentially said there is literally nothing that has happened all year to support the notion of picking Ohio State. There really is. There, they had not played to the level that I believed they could play at and that I felt was necessary to beat Michigan once all season. I mean, had they? Am I missing a game? I don't think so. TCU at the time, maybe, but they you know, We they thought so, off, right? but TCU didn't turn out to be a very good team. Exactly. I mean, they, they had a lot of injuries, so mm-hmm. it's hard to know what TCU would have been had they not been banged up. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't know kind of how to, how to put it in perspective. Like, on one hand, I think they showed their potential against Michigan. We'll see if they show their potential against Northwestern and if they then get an opportunity to play for the national championship. But if not, I guess I kind of feel like they have no one to blame but themselves. Like, I, I, I know there's going to be a popular narrative of, well, if the league were better and this and that. You know what? Had they not played like they did against Purdue, we wouldn't be having this conversation. And it was them. They did that to themselves. So I, I do feel like, ultimately, I still think they have a chance. I mean, I think if they overwhelm Northwestern and then we'll kind of see what goes on elsewhere, I think they have a chance. But if they don't do it, it's because they underachieved and because they did not play to their level week in and week out. Right. And I want to get your thoughts on where the Buckeyes stack up with Oklahoma and in that playoff picture in just a second. But before we move on to that, um, I want to get your thoughts on Dwayne Haskins because he's having an unbelievable season, especially numbers-wise. I want to uh, you know, pick your brain. Where does he stack up among the great quarterback seasons you've seen over the years in the Big Ten? And well, beyond that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty amazing, right? I mean, last week he set the all-time record for touchdown passes in a single season in the league, most passing yards. I think he's remarkable. I think what makes it more remarkable is they went through a long stretch where they just could not run the ball, mm-hmm. which, again, was counterintuitive. I mean, I don't understand it. They have two excellent backs, 1,000-yard backs uh, earlier in their career as to why they weren't able to run it. Who knows? But they weren't, and so there was more onus on him. They have a fantastic wide receiver group. Uh, I mean, one of the better ones to be. But just the the variety of ways that that group can beat you is mind-boggling. So I think their passing game is as good as any that I've seen in the Big Ten. I mean, I guess I think back to Purdue with Drew Brees. I mean, they could sling it around. There, There have been other examples in the league of really great passing games through the years. But I put this one up there with anyone. Uh, he makes fantastic decisions. He's got a massive arm. 
and he doesn't really seem to be phased. I, I feel like you go back to that Michigan game last year where he got thrown into the fire, his team was down in the biggest game, and he figured out a way to help rally them and came up with one enormous throw. I mean, as, about as big a pressure throw as you could make. To me, that kind of sent a message to, to the rest of the league that, hey, there's nothing that's going to phase me, and, and he's carried forward in that way. Yeah, he's been really great, and watching the BTN Journey feature on him seems like a, it's a really nice guy, yep. great family, so uh, good to see his success this year and, and last. Um, so moving on to, before we get into the title game and the matchups uh, themselves, I want you to try and get inside the mind of the committee, and, and yeah, we're talking Tuesday afternoon before the rankings even right. come out. Um, but it looks like that fourth spot will come down to either Oklahoma or Ohio State. So we don't know the rankings. We obviously don't know the weekend's outcomes. But just head-to-head right now, between the Sooners and Buckeyes, who do you think has the edge at this point? Yeah, that's the problem. I mean, I suppose we're kind of dating ourselves yeah. right away because people will listen to this and, and know who the committee thinks has the edge. I'm going to sound like a, a total homer, but I just don't understand. We had this discussion last week. I just don't understand why it's okay for Oklahoma – to have a dreadful defense, and it's not okay for Ohio State to have some defensive struggles. I think Ohio State is being judged unfairly. They're being judged against themselves historically. The committee expects them to have a good defense, and so when they don't, and they don't this year, this is a very average defense nationally, but when they don't have a good defense, I feel like they're being penalized for it. People are saying, well, this is Ohio State. You should have a good defense. Whereas they look at Oklahoma and say, well, yeah, Oklahoma never has a good defense. So that's okay. They can give up over 40 points four games in a row, including to Kansas. And, well, we'll just give them a pass. So I hope that the committee, again, regardless of what happens Tuesday night, because it, although I think this is a very big ranking because, mm-hmm. because they're then going to set a precedent, I think, for, for what happens on Sunday. But regardless of what happens Tuesday night, I hope that they will judge on their face who do we think has – who's better offensively, who's better defensively, and then how do we merge that together into into who's a better team. And I think Ohio State has more ways to beat you than Oklahoma does, which isn't to say I haven't been blown away by Oklahoma offensively. I think they are absolutely fabulous. I think Kyler Murray's been unreal. I've watched them a number of times, and I'm, uh, again, really, really impressed. But their defense is a joke. I mean, it is so bad. I mean, watching the West Virginia game, it was was like a, a... video game so I feel like at a certain point you just have to say come on like at what point do we we cut off are we really going to put the 100th best defense in America in there uh, that that seems extreme it's almost like that larger narrative around the big 12 never playing defense is like their safety net you know it, it, it's kind of propped up or excuse them from having a, a good defense uh, to your point um, so yeah since it's Tuesday we won't get in, into the rankings or the committee anymore uh, till we till we see those but I want to get into this weekend's matchup in Indy and, and just get your thoughts on who has the advantages. Um, Ohio State obviously is going to be favored, so I wouldn't call it a letdown. Well, maybe it would be a letdown if they lost to Northwestern, but, but how do they avoid um, some of the subpar performances like we've seen, uh, even though I, we kind of diagnosed it earlier, we don't right. know what to think of them. Well, I mean, I think it absolutely would be a letdown if they lost to Northwestern. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess what I'm saying is if they play at the level they played against Michigan, yeah. Northwestern can't beat them. I don't think there's really much of anyone in the country could beat them. That's not. I'm not trying to. That's not a, a shot at Northwestern in any way. I just think it's realistic. I mean, they're that team. The way that Ohio State played on Saturday. I mean, that was as good a performance as, as we've seen in the country this year. I mean, it, they overwhelmed the best defense in the country statistically. So yeah, I mean, it would be a letdown from where they were last Saturday. How do they avoid it? I, I don't know. The only thing I would say is. One thing that's really stood out to me in covering Urban Meyer through the years, Alex, is I just feel like he knows what buttons to push when it really matters. And I know there have been exceptions. I know there have been occasional games here and there where they don't show up. You know, like certainly it's happened in the college football playoff. There have been games, as we talked about, during the course of the regular season where they don't show up. But I feel like more often than not, I mean, the guy's lost like two November games, right, in his entire time at, at Ohio State. I mean, I feel like when the chips are down, he is really, really good. He seems to have the pulse of his team. So I believe that Ohio State will come ready to play on Saturday, and, and I think they'll play well. But, again, I'd be lying if I said I really understood this team this year. They have... It has been head scratching some of these performances, right? And especially with the defense not being uh, 
quite as good as years past. It seems like with Ohio State, it's just about finding that rhythm. And against Penn State, they kind of found it the last possible second. Against Purdue, they never found it. And against Michigan, they had it from the very beginning. So right. it's for me, is it, you know, are they going to find that rhythm at any point during that game? If they find it early on, I think Northwestern's going to have a tough time. But in your opinion, what does Northwestern have to do to not only keep this close, but to win on Saturday? Well, I think what Northwestern will do, the big challenge for Northwestern is how do you defend Ohio State? And part of it's going to be about the health of their secondary. I mean, as you know, I'm sure three of their four defensive back starters have sat out the last two games. So are those guys back? There's a significant difference between those guys and players who've been playing. I mean, Montre Hardage in particular is is a really good defensive back. I think they're going to have to play zone. You know, what Northwestern has done really well this year is they give up a lot of field goals and they don't give up a lot of touchdowns. They keep the ball in front of them. Mike Hankowitz is one of the best defensive coordinators in the country. He is a really good strategic X and O guy. But, you know, again, you can say the same about Don Brown. I mean, some might argue Don Brown is the best defensive mm-hmm. coordinator in the country. And we saw what Ohio State did to him when they were clicking. So just because you have a, a really good X and O defensive mastermind kind of guy, you know, sometimes, as they say, it's the Jimmys and the Joes and not the X's and the O's. And, and the Jimmys and Joes are definitely better on the Ohio State side. But what Northwestern would have to do, they'll play zone, I'm sure, defensively. They'll try to keep the ball in front of them and, and inside of them. And they'll see whether or not they can make Ohio State drive the length of the field and make some mistakes. And, and if they can't make, some, make them make some mistakes, then can they at least hold them to a field goal? And then on the other side... I don't know. I mean, it'll be interesting to see if Northwestern moves the ball. I, it's not a great offensive team by any stretch, but they become a little bit more balanced. I think Thorson's been a little better. Nagel would be a big part of it if he's healthy. And again, he sat out basically the last two games. So is, is he ready to go? He's a receiver that can be a, a challenging matchup for people. Uh, and then I think you need to... You, well, the thing that has stood out with Ohio State's defense is... They've made a lot of the same mistakes from the beginning of the year to the end. They avoid gaps, particularly the linebackers. They have coverage breakdowns. So I think the thing that you have to do is try to confuse them. You know, jet sweep action and all this kind of stuff. That has proven, and you look at the Maryland game, I mean, that confounded them mm-hmm. in the Maryland game. So does Northwestern have some sort of a game plan in place? It's not normally what they do, but do they try to integrate some of that stuff to throw Ohio State off? But I think it's a huge, huge mountain to climb. I mean, Ohio State is unequivocally the better team. Can Northwestern beat them? Sure, but a lot would have to go right for them and, and wrong for Ohio State. All right, one more thing on India. I saw your tweet uh, pretty recently, and I know there's been a lot of publicity around it, but Northwestern's bringing a huge population of students to the game. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're busing like something like 40 something percent of, of their student body to the game. That's, I know it's a small school, but that's pretty cool. That's pretty remarkable. What kind of overall representation do you think Northwestern will have uh, in Indy? I just think back to the NCAA tournament when they had a lot more fans, honestly, than I expected uh, showing out there, especially so far from home. So, what do you think the overall showing will be from a, a small school like Northwestern this weekend? My guess is it will be pretty good. Uh, you're right. I covered that NCAA tournament for BTN. And, I mean, honestly, of the eight teams in Salt Lake City, I honestly believe Northwestern may have had more fans there than the other seven collectively. I mean, it was insane. Uh, you know, you think back to the Rose Bowl in 1995 where you know, the game was played in Los Angeles and they had two-thirds, if not more, of, of the fans in the Rose Bowl. You know, Northwestern is a small school. It's also kind of a far-flung school, and that, that, that tends to work against them massively in home attendance because a lot of alums don't stay in Chicago. So if you have a student body that's 25% the size of the other schools in the conference and then 60 or 70% of them move out of state, it's pretty hard to, to fill up your stadium. In the past, they have done pretty well drawing for bowl games, drawing for, for big events. So we'll see. Uh, you know, again, they sold out their allotment, which is ten thousand in I think less than forty eight hours. But as to how many more fans will show up, uh, we'll, we'll see. I think it's going to be a really good atmosphere. I think it'll be a, a ton of fun. I, I think it's always neat to bring new blood to to Indy. Having covered every single one of these games, there is a different excitement each year when there's a a program that hasn't been there, and this becomes now the seventh program. So fully half the the conference has been to Indianapolis. Yeah, looking forward to it. One more thing, Dave, before we wrap up. I want to get your thoughts on uh, the other side of the big game this past weekend, and that's Michigan. You know, all this buildup going into this past weekend's game, it seemed like this was Michigan's, you know, time finally to knock off the Buckeyes, the revenge tour, all that drama, all that hype. 
where do you go from here if you're that program? Like, I, I was just putting myself in a position of a Michigan fan. Like, I couldn't, I, I wouldn't know what to think, honestly, at this point, just because it seemed like it was all set up this year for them. So, what are your thoughts on where they stand? I'm really stunned. I really, really, 100% believe that Michigan was going to win the game. I just felt like everything had aligned in their favor. I felt like they were the better team. Again, I mentioned earlier, I think Ohio State, across the board, on average, maybe has slightly more talent. But, you know, again, like Bosa being out equalized it probably significantly. And I just felt like Michigan had been so much more cohesive as a team through the course of this year. And I just felt like it was their time. And and I'm really stunned of about how they played. And, and look, it, were injuries a part of it? Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of different things you could point to. But in the end, there was no excuse for them to play in the way that they did. And, and now you're sitting at a point where... I mean, Michigan is in its longest gap now ever in the history of the program without winning a Big Ten championship. I understand people say, well, you took over a a program that was kind of a train wreck. But you look at the NFL draft in the early years of Jim Harbaugh. I mean, there was a lot of talent there. Ten first rounders, I think. Uh, Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's a little unfair to say, you know, the the team wasn't very good, but there was a lot of talent. Mm -hmm. Now, did you have to rebuild infrastructure and all that? Yes. I mean, I'm not saying he should have gone in and, and been able to win right away. But now you're through a, a cycle where essentially is all his own guys. They were fortunate enough to get a quarterback eligible right away, which is somewhat of an unusual situation, and he was a perfect fit for what they wanted to do. So I don't know. I mean, they're going to lose a ton of talent off this team going into next year. And if I, you know, I mean, again, I we kind of root for all the teams here. You, you want to see teams do well. Um, so I was going to say if I'm a Michigan fan, but, you know, I'm a fan of all these programs. I want to see our programs maximize their potential and so sitting there and kind of watching the spot that's, that Michigan is in, I don't know what the solution is. I, I, I don't know other than you keep recruiting really high-level players, and eventually it feels like you have to break through against Ohio State. But for whatever reason, it is very clear that the psychological advantage in that rivalry is residing so strongly in Columbus, it, it cannot be overstated. And I don't know how you overcome that. But, but man, there's a lot of talent on campus in Michigan. There will be a lot of talent there next year, and there will be a lot of talent there for as long as Jim Harbaugh's there. They just need to figure out a way to beat those guys. And, and you know, do you need to be – I mean, one of the schools of thought I've heard is maybe you need to be more wide open. Maybe in this day and age you need to be a, a program which can put 50 or 60 points routinely on the board against – maybe don't put 60 routinely, but can put 50. I mean, Oklahoma is averaging 50 points a game. Uh, maybe that's who you have to be, right, in, in this day and age. And, and maybe they need to change their offensive philosophy. And maybe it's not defense that wins championships. Maybe it's it's a little bit more balanced. I think there are arguments to be made all over there, but it feels like to me, and I don't know where you stand on this, but to me there is a mental barrier there as well. And and that, I think, is maybe the biggest challenge. Yeah, I mean, when you go 14 to 15 uh, losses against your rival, I, I don't see how it wouldn't be mental. And I was, right. I'm with you. I thought Michigan was rolling. You know, they just have that look, that vibe. And I thought they were going to handle business. And, and for it to go completely the other way, that shocked me as well. So it's not Michigan. It's Ohio State. And it's Northwestern this weekend in Indy. And uh, looking forward to it. I'll see you there. And I appreciate you joining me, Dave. Thanks. All right. Thanks for having me, Alex. Yep. All right. Thanks once again to Dave for joining me. A lot of great stuff from him. I enjoyed having him back on. And hopefully we can have him on again in the future. I always appreciate his analysis. All right, we'll move on to our second guest on this episode. As I mentioned at the top, it's former ESPN writer, regular TV contributor on ESPN, and current director of sports journalism at Northwestern, J.A. Adande. J.A. and I uh, talk quite a bit about his time at ESPN, his path to the academic world at Northwestern, and some current uh you know tidbits about the team and, and some tidbits about what athletics was like when he covered northwestern sports as a student and how far that athletic department and that football program has come so a lot of good stuff with ja we'll get to that in just a second but first one more note from our sponsor the northwestern school of professional studies you can build a solid foundation in the strategic creative and analytic skills that are essential for success in the business of sports in the master's program in sports administration at Northwestern University. Find out more at sps.northwestern.edu slash sports. All right, thanks again to our sponsor, and we'll now get to our interview with J.A. Adande. That interview starts right now. 
I'm very pleased to be joined by the Director of Sports Journalism at Northwestern University. He's a former sports writer for ESPN, and it's J.A. Adande. You can follow him on Twitter at J.A. Adande. Mr. Adande, welcome, and thanks for joining me. Thank you. Great to be here. Yeah, so before we get into uh, you know the topic of the week with Northwestern being in the Big Ten title game, your alma mater, I, I want to first lead off with uh, a little background on yourself and where you've been, because a lot of people, and I'm sure a lot of listeners, know your name from your days at ESPN on the national stage. So first off, where have you been the last uh, couple of years or so, and, and what's been going on since you left ESPN? Yeah, I've been here on campus in Evanston and in Chicago. We've got our undergraduate campuses in Evanston. Our graduate journalism program is in downtown Chicago. Um, so I've been splitting my time between those two locations. Uh, my first year here, I was still working for ESPN close to full-time. I, I was still writing regularly. I was still doing sidelines uh, for TV. I was uh, covering the NBA playoffs. <laughs> I thought back uh I think between games three and four in uh, the 2017 NBA Finals, I was uh, <laughs> I was grading papers all day. I just hold up in the hotel room and I had to, to grade papers and finish off my my grades for the quarter. Um, so now it's a little bit more normal pace. I'm I'm down to just maybe a couple around the horn appearances per month uh, and no ESPN related travel or assignments. Uh, so now I. I have plenty of time to devote to meetings and emails. I tell people that's my, my life now in academia, meetings and emails and preparing for lectures. So did that decision to greatly scale back and pretty much remove yourself from ESPN was just because of the balance that you had to deal with? Like you said, you know, you were holed up and <laughs> grading papers all day. Was that was that pretty much all that went into it, or was there anything else uh, going into that decision? I'd, I'd say that's mainly it. I, you know, if I wanted to do this job and do it properly, I really needed to dedicate myself to it full time. It's funny when I first got the job, I just wasn't ready to say I used to work at ESPN. I wasn't prepared to distance myself. Um, you know, I didn't want to give that up. So it just worked out where my contract was up at ESPN, but we renewed for another year, and um, we were able to do that right around the same time we finalized my agreement with Northwestern. So. I didn't want people's first reaction to say, what, you're leaving ESPN? No, that was not the case my, my first year. Um, but then after one year of trying to do both, it, it really wasn't untenable. And at that point, I, I felt like I had gotten just about everything I needed to or wanted to get out of my time at ESPN. Um, you know, and, and I didn't see really advancing higher and doing this job at Northwestern. Uh, you know, I, I did have to make that choice. And I was really interested in pursuing this. This was something different. I, I got a lot out of my journalism career, went to places I didn't even expect to. Um, and it was all that I could have asked for and more. So I was able to leave feeling very satisfied that I had squeezed pretty much everything I could have from the journalism world. And I was ready to try to try to match those type of accomplishments in the academic world. Yeah, you became a very household name at ESPN, I would say. I mean, I grew up watching you on shows like Around the Horn, uh, occasionally on PTI, and you know you're a very front-facing figure. So, looking back at those years, what were some of your favorite memories or, or times from you know being around the horn, chopping up with those guys and, and, and girls, and being you know a host of PTI and maybe on other shows? What what are some favorite memories that still stand out to you and that you might miss a little bit? Just the fact that doing PTI, when you sit in, or around the horn, when you sit in those chairs um, and it's funny because it's not very glamorous, the production of it. You're, most of us are in a room by ourselves. You know, there's a remote-controlled camera. Um, there's a green screen behind us. You know, we don't even have a window. When I did it in L.A., it was a small windowless room, and I was in there by myself. So that aspect of it wasn't very glamorous. But you're connected to some of the great sports journalists in the country and people that I've gotten to know over the years. And so actually kind of behind the scenes really became my favorite part. We just have fun the whole process of taping the show became really fun. And we tried to capture some of that in those little behind the scenes vignettes that you can see on social media. Um, you know, but that's really what makes it so fun. We start telling stories. So, you know, we paid five has the best stories, including how he was the first to find out the first journalist to find out that Arthur King had, had died from the, the wound suffered in the gunshot now in, in, uh, in Memphis all those years ago. Um, believe it or not, Woody was on the scene reporting that. Stories like that, um, uh, you know, just kind of behind the scenes travel tales that all sports journalists have. 
uh, travel tips, um, you know, favorite ranking cities, all, all, all the stuff that sports writers do when we get together. Sports writers have the best stories. And uh, when we're sitting there in between segments on Around the Horn, a lot of those stories come out. So that, that's just fun. That, that part was fun. Um, just making the show is fun. I remember, uh, I, remember uh, I think it was Randall Simon on the Pirates uh, whacked the Milwaukee <laughs> Sausage Racers yeah. in the costume. Yeah. When they were going by the Pittsburgh Pirates dugout and it took a whack, whack at him or her with the bat. And, um, you know, that was caused a big stir. So we were debating that and what should the punishment be, this, that, the other. And the next day I was at the grocery store and it just hit me. I said, you know what? I got paid to go on TV and talk about a guy in a sausage costume getting hit with a baseball bat. <laughs> you know, this is a pretty great job. This right. Pretty fun. And I think that was 2003 because that was the year Randall Simon was traded to the Cubs. And that was kind of the first year I really started watching baseball and paying attention. I remember that so well. And uh, <laughs> that's crazy about Woody Page, that anecdote about him. And I did not, uh, did not realize uh, that – First of all, he goes back that far, and that you know he would have been on scene to cover something like that. He, so. goes, he goes back a lot <laughs> farther than that, but uh, actually, that that was right when he was starting off in the business. So he was a young reporter in Memphis, and uh, he got assigned to you know they they farmed out uh, reporters all along to the hospitals throughout the uh, throughout the city after the word came out that Martin King had been shot, and turned out Dr. King was at the hospital that Woody was assigned to. And he had to sneak his way in, um, and he just kind of overheard somebody say that. He was gone, and he had a pretty good idea who he was <laughs> that he'd overheard. Right. So um, that's how he found out first. That's wild. Um, one more question about your ESPN and Around the Horn days. What do you think of the new setup they have? I mean, it, it's crazy because they hadn't really changed the look over the course of the 15 years or whatever, and now they got this pretty much VR set going on. So what are your thoughts on the new look? Yeah, we had one revamp when we went to HD. Um, that's how old the show is. We predate HD. Um, but, yeah, this is, this is a much – bigger leap into the future um and i actually was up in new york a couple weeks ago so i got to see them shoot it um in the studio and really the what's changed for us on the inside not much changed for those of us in the seats Tony reality's job got a lot harder because um at times he's having to interact um without even really seeing the panelists you know before when it was physical screens in front of them um you know it was easy for him to interact but now, when they pull guys out, when it's one-on-one or, you know, face-to-face, you know, they'll, sometimes they'll pull out and they'll have a discussion between two people. Whenever that happens, Tony can't see that in the studio. So now it's, it's kind of, he's piloting blind. He also has more responsibility. He's got more gadgets. So, you know, he can do the effects that didn't have, it used to just be the mute button and the joystick. Now he's got all these special effects he can add as well. So there's a lot more responsibility for Tony. Um, you know, I think he's more than up for it. He's the one that that asked for it and uh, suggested a lot of these changes. He's grown into the role of host. That is, you know, at the point it's hard to the show that the show ever started without him. Of course, Max Kellerman was original host in 2002. Um, but you know, Tony's the one who who is affected the most by the changes. But but he's the one who's best prepared for it. Yeah, it's wild. And it's really you know a testament to the longevity of that show that it's still popular, still around, and I still watch when I can. Um, moving on, I want to get into your your current career before we talk a little bit of uh northwestern football so you mentioned you're you're at northwestern now full-time in the academia world uh you brought your students by the big 10 studios big 10 network studio a couple weeks ago um a class of i believe master's students and i was just curious do you have an example or or an anecdote of some habits that your students have or things they say or do that really illustrates how much sports media has changed since you were in their position in school one thing that I noticed last year um, with our graduate students is just how comfortable they are in video. And I, was, uh, you know, I asked them for the final project. They had to do a written assignment, a video assignment, and they just feel more comfortable communicating video. And I think you're seeing that as a byproduct of the generation that's going up um, with Snapchat or FaceTime or you know, video communication. And uh, they're just so adept at editing. Uh, you know, some of the projects that I asked them to turn around pretty quickly would take me days to do. Cause I would have to figure out how to use the video editing software, and I'd probably very clumsily navigate my way through. But this is something that comes very easily to them. So, um, you know, on the one hand, they're they're adept and, and they're better prepared for that world, uh, the world that just didn't even exist when I was going to school. But on the other hand, they still have an interest in sort of the basics. Like, got students this year, they, they want to be a baseball beat writer, for example. 
Um, you know, so these traditional jobs, I think, still have appeal for a lot of them. So that's great for me to hear that, that they're prepared and they're skilled in the new tools that, that all journalists need to have today. But they also have those old school interests. So the, the good news is the interest hasn't gone away. Um, not everyone is seduced by television. Not everyone is seduced by social media. I think a lot of people still still admire and aspire to have these, these traditional journalistic roles. So you have all these students, and you have a big event like the Big Ten Championship game coming up. Do you now structure maybe your course material around the fact that Northwestern's in the game, or do you have any assignments structured around the upcoming event? No, and in part it has to do with the class I'm teaching. The graduate class is a sports and society, so it's kind of bigger picture. Sure. I really don't get into the, the ups and downs, the week in, week out of the football team, uh, basketball team, like, that really doesn't come into play. Um, I'm looking more at the, the big picture of sport, the sports media landscape, for example, and the tools you need and the issues, um, the crises, you could even say, uh, in the sports media landscape. So my particular classes are not tied into you know, the ups and downs of, of any particular team or what's necessarily going on in any particular sport, but the issues that come about. So... For example, we weren't going to talk about the U.S. Open results, but the whole explosion uh, and how Serena, like in real time, turned the U.S. Open women's final into a referendum on on gender equality in sports. Uh, those are the type of issues that I like to tackle. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, and before I get into the game, I just want to get into your background a little bit, even farther before your ESPN days. Uh, to your days walking the Evanston campus as a student. Um, and I want to get an idea uh, of what the state of Northwestern sports were when you were a student there. I mean, obviously, Northwestern <laughs> football has had success dating back to at least the mid-'90s, and this is kind of a natural progression for them to uh, be in the, the title game at this point. They've been on the scene for a while. But, you know, with the facilities they have now, and especially the football facility, which has got so much publicity, can you kind of put in perspective the progress the athletic department has made in, in just building up their athletic department since uh, since you were a student there. Wait, it's this great divide. I think you won't find a bigger divide in Northwestern alumni than uh, those who came basically from my era and before, and those who came afterward. Um, I guess the the freshman. Well, no, the the year after I graduated, that freshman class they they went to the Rose Bowl their senior year. Um, you know, so like the. The students who are now, they, they've grown up in a time in which Northwestern athletic success, and particularly in football, I mean, they've had tremendous success in the women's sports. But if you look at the uh, the revenue sports, um, you know, Northwestern and success go together. You know, it's not that far-fetched that Northwestern could go to a bowl game, could win a bowl game. Not that far-fetched even that they could win a division championship in, in the Big Ten. Um, those things were not even on the table when I went to school. The basketball team went 0 for the Big Ten Conference uh, my junior year. The football team went 0 and 11 my sophomore year. Uh, you know, I think the basketball team won a total of six Big Ten games while I was an undergraduate. I think the football team won like seven total. You know, so year in, year out, these teams win more games than they won, you know, the entirety of my undergraduate career. So that that's the easiest way to sum up the difference. Um, it's a different commitment at the administrative level. Warren Shapiro and Jim Phillips, the athletic director, Warren Shapiro, the university president, uh, they have made athletics a, a bigger priority and, and they have they see no reason why the athletic department should lag behind the rest of the university. I mean, it's, it's a first-class university in so many ways and they've really adopted the mindset that that athletics, you know, across the board, and again, not just football and basketball, across the board, but those are the two sports that attract the most attention. Uh, but they feel like they should be on par with the rest of the standards in the university, and they've managed to reach that level. So you mentioned the uh, success or lack thereof that some of the teams had when you were a student. Did you cover uh, any of the you know, bigger sports teams on campus at that time? And Were there oh, any, yes, horror, yes. So any horror stories? Year, of <laughs> uh, I, I, so I, I was basically at all 11. Maybe, actually, maybe I didn't do the last one, and I might have gone to Thanksgiving vacation, but I, I think I was at 10 of the 11. Uh, losses that, that they took in my sophomore year. I remember kind of it bottomed out in East Lansing. Uh, they just got pounded something like 63 to 14 or something in Michigan State. And 
it was so cold afterward. I remember the, the ink in my pen froze as I was trying to do the interviews outside the locker room. Um, yeah, that was that was just a pretty miserable experience. Um, uh, you know, covering that that 18 basketball team in the Big Ten, um, spinning out in snowbanks, driving through Michigan as, as we got to cover the team around around the conference. Um, I experienced a lot of those losses firsthand, believe me. I, I, I once kept tally. I, I'd seen the football team lose in like seven states, you know, like pretty much all the Big Ten states. I saw them lose a non-conference game to Rice one year in Texas, uh, the Rose Bowl in California. Um, yeah, at one point I had a running tally of all the different states I'd seen the Northwestern football team lose. But, uh, you know, now I can start tallying up victories. Uh, I could say I was there for their first bowl win since the 1940s, I, and I had to be there for their first NCAA tournament appearance, you know, last year in, in Salt Lake City. And, uh, you know, this Saturday I'm looking forward to being there for their first uh, appearance in the Big Ten Championship game. I mean, you're dating yourself just with the, the pen reference there. Who uses pens anymore when they're covering <laughs> the game? Yeah, well, my, my digital recorder probably would have been okay but uh, if I had one. But, yeah, the pen, the pen froze up. So obviously you followed, you know, what Pat Fitzgerald has done over the years and, and how he's built this program up. What characteristics have you seen out of him that you can kind of just over the years attribute to it culminating in a season like this and, and a Big Ten Coach of the Year honor and a Big Ten championship game appearance? Positivity and the ability to keep the focus um, on the bigger picture. I think those are those are two things that he really instills in his team. And, um you know, we've seen it. It's funny because Northwestern athletics has been one thing since I've graduated. You know, I, I covered them objectively. Some would say negatively when, when I was in school. But, you know, I, there wasn't much good to report, right? I, I gave you all the statistics on how they perform. So, you know, it's, it's not like I was writing these glowing uh, accounts of these games. Um, but, you know, afterward, when I wasn't covering the team, and especially once I was no longer covering college sports, um, you know, I was an avid fan of, of my alma mater and um it it actually in some ways enables me to to give them more of a chance because the last three years now they've gotten off to slow starts in the season but and objectively you might say well it doesn't look good for them the prospects don't look good they're not performing very well but the fan in me that wants to be optimistic has looked at the trend and how this team has gotten better over the course of the year it's three years in a row now. You know, this, this team takes a while, but it, it, it manages to put it together. So if you're looking for reasons to be optimistic, you know, and maybe even unnecessarily optimistic, I kept looking to the recent track record. Um, you know, it was a little harder this year, but <laughs> losing to Akron, um, and you're just sitting there thinking, okay, I, I don't know where the path to bowl eligibility exists now. I, I counted them on having this game. Um, but lo and behold, they were able to pull up. And, and, you know, We've seen that's a characteristic now of, of a Pat Fitzgerald team is the way uh, that they that they keep improving, that they keep at it, that they don't get discouraged when when things go wrong. And um, you know, I think seeing it now three straight years, I think that's a Pat Fitzgerald attribute that this team has adopted. All right, Jay, you mentioned you are going to the game. You wouldn't miss it in person. Is there some sort of Northwestern, you know, secret society reunion of media <laughs> plan that we need to know about? What's, what's going on with the uh, the journalists that will be in attendance? Not, not that secret, but, you know, the, the, the signal has gone out. So I think they'll, they'll probably be inundated with social media photos of, you know, Christine Brennan and Mike Wilbon and, and Kevin Blackstone and, and the likes of, of our Medill alumni in particular. Um you know, gathering together and having a good time and assembling. And, and you know, just that, I think we're just really looking forward to enjoying this. Uh, I don't think any of us counted on, on being here uh, when the season started, particularly after a few games into the season. So um, it's great. It's a great accomplishment, you know. But look at Ohio State, you know, they probably expected to be here all, all year long. But um, for Northwestern, this is an accomplishment. This is a step. It's, it's not the, the final destination. And, you know, there's still the possibility of the Rose Bowl. I thought one thing was cool. I was invited in the locker room after they, they beat Nebraska in the homecoming, that great comeback victory they wound up winning in overtime. And, I mean, one thing Pat Fitzgerald told the team is all of our goals are still in front of us. You know, even though they'd had those disappointing non-conference losses, um, you know, they could still accomplish everything they set out to do, and that still applies. So, you know, they accomplished their first goal, which was winning the division. They still have the opportunity to, to win the Big Ten, go to the Rose Bowl and to win the Rose Bowl. Like, that's still in play. Yeah, and you 
mentioned some of your former colleagues and uh, fellow alumni. I- I'm curious, who would you say if you had to pick one or two people are the are the biggest Northwestern bleed purple fans out there that uh, that are in the sports media landscape? Will Bond, Darren Ravel, for sure. Um, you know, Christine Brandon, Rachel Nichols. She was there with me at the uh, at the uh, NCAA tournament game last year. Um, you know, that those are a few who, who wave the purple very loudly and, and prominently. You know, you'll see that Northwestern football helmet on the desk of PTI with Will Bond all the time. Um, you know, there, there's plenty more, but but those ones draw the most attention, I'd say. Yeah, no surprises there. All right, last question before I let you go, J.A. Uh, do you have a prediction for the outcome of this game? Obviously, Ohio State probably has the edge talent-wise. They're probably favored, but uh, I want to get your unbiased or maybe biased opinion <laughs> on what's what's going to happen here this weekend. The unbiased opinion? <laughs> I, I would pick Ohio State. I mean, they're coming in scoring, you know, at what average, like 55 points a game their last two games. Um, you know, the biased opinion, the purple's going to Pasadena, like Gary Barnett once said. Um, you know, but I, I, I just look forward to an entertaining experience either way. Um, you know, objectively, I'd, I'd have to look at it's going to be difficult for, for Northwestern to keep pace with, with Ohio State's offense. Um, you know, particularly if the secondary you know, had some injuries, secondary, and if those guys aren't feeling better by Saturday, um, it would be a long afternoon. But um, on the one hand, if you would have told me to start the season that Wildcats would be 60 minutes from going to Pasadena. Um, I'd be all in for it. So that's that's why I'm going to be there. That's why the, the whole contingent's going to be there in Indianapolis on Saturday. And we're all looking forward to it. All right, Jay. That's all I got for you. Thanks so much for taking the time. Uh, enjoy the weekend. And maybe I'll see you down there. All right. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Thanks once again to J.A. for joining me. Really enjoyed that discussion. Uh, really cool to have him in our backyard here in the Chicagoland area. I'm sure doing great things at Northwestern. Miss him regularly on ESPN, but um, you know, really nice guy and, and really fun to talk to. So thanks, J.A. And now we'll get to our final interview on this episode. Uh, this really packed episode ahead of the Big Ten Championship game. And the interview is with Harold Shelton. It's our regular BTN Stathead segment where we go behind the numbers of Big Ten sports, obviously we focus on a lot of uh, Big Ten championship football talk, and we talk about the college football playoff rankings as well, heading into the final weekend here before the final rankings come out. We also talk a little hoops with H as well toward the end, uh, just with the ACC and Big Ten challenge going on, I had to squeeze a little bit in. So heavy football talk and then some hoops before we uh, wrap up and head to Indy. So here he is, it's BTN researcher Harold Shelton. All right, I'm very pleased to be joined once again by BTN researcher Harold Shelton for another BTN Stathead segment. We're ahead of the Big Ten Championship game this weekend in Indianapolis. H, almost made it to the finish line. Uh, first of all, can you believe that we're a few days away from Indy here? Yeah, it's it's funny. Like it, I felt like it was so far away, but at the same time, the season moved really fast. Either way, I'm glad that the uh, I could see the light at the end of the tunnel, that's for sure. Absolutely. November's... You know, always hectic around here, so we, we've almost crossed that threshold, and uh, should be a fun weekend in Indianapolis. It always is, oh, uh, for sure. you know, with the Big Ten Super Bowl vibe kind of deal going on. Um, so we'll get to that matchup in just a second and get it in the, to the numbers and the uh, breakdown and all that. But first, I want to talk about Tuesday night's college football playoff rankings because I think it kind of played out how we both expected, and Ohio State now has entered back into the the mix, and Michigan is out of the mix, the team we've been talking about pretty much for the last six or seven weeks. So now with Ohio State back in the mix at number six, uh, two spots out of a college football playoff berth, what were your overall takeaways from what the committee showed us showed us uh, Tuesday night? I wasn't too surprised. Uh, the biggest thing I wanted to see is how far apart Ohio State and Oklahoma were. Uh, would, uh, would that performance over Michigan be enough to vault them all the way over Oklahoma, even though Oklahoma was four spots ahead the week before. Uh, I thought the committee kind of made a statement saying that Oklahoma was still better than Ohio State, and I don't really know if that changes uh, going into this, uh, going after Saturday. Yeah, and for anyone who didn't see, it was uh, Alabama, Clemson, Notre Dame, 
Georgia at number four, so Georgia and Alabama, one of them will likely be knocked out if the expected result happens. People think Alabama is going to beat Georgia and knock them out, so then it leaves Oklahoma and Ohio State. So do you think the, the distinction, and from what you've heard out of those committee members' mouths, is the distinction, the severity of the loss to Purdue and the fact that Oklahoma has uh, only lost to, to Texas by three, three points, yeah. is that pretty much the distinction that is uh, – being conveyed by the committee? Uh, I definitely think that's part of it. Um, It does seem like Oklahoma's getting a little bit of a pass with the bad defense that they play, and it's one of those, like, hey, it's the Big 12, so, you know, they're expected to play bad defense, but they have a historic offense. (laughs) Meanwhile, Ohio State's defense, which is, even though it, it struggled a lot this year, it's still better than Oklahoma's, but they seem like they're getting penalized a little bit more for it. Um... I think they that Ohio State, even with a win, will need some help. Um, like you said, I think Alabama would have to beat Georgia to knock Georgia out. And let's see if, if Tom Herman, old friend Tom Herman, mm-hmm. can do the Buckeyes a solid and beat Oklahoma for the second time because Oklahoma's only loss is to Texas, and they avenged that loss. You know, I think that would go a long way compared to a 29-point loss that Ohio State had against Purdue. Uh, Ohio State in 2014 had a 14-point loss to Virginia Tech and still got in, which is the worst loss by any playoff team. And uh, this year's Ohio State more than doubled that, and Purdue wound up only going 6-6. and It's not a great look. Yeah, so last year we kind of saw a similar scenario play out. Ohio State was left on the outside looking in, one spot out, even after they won the night before uh, the Big Ten Championship game. So... Do you think Ohio State's only path is if Alabama and Oklahoma win or, or lose them? Alabama wins and Oklahoma loses. Or is there wiggle room there if you know Ohio State blows out Northwestern and Oklahoma narrowly beats Texas in the Big 12 title game? I think Ohio State would definitely have to have a 2014 Wisconsin title game scenario mm-hmm. where they just look the part, you know, 59 nothing. Uh, I mean, Oklahoma wins a game, you know, 70 to 67 or you know some crazy big 12 score that just continues to show how bad their defense is uh otherwise i yeah, it'll be hard for me to see ohio state jump in oklahoma I mean, oklahoma's playing the tougher opponent according to the committee they're already ahead of them as it is you know, they're playing texas who's 14th northwestern fell out of the top 20 uh it would just be hard for me to see the committee bumping them up so Assuming Ohio State takes care of business and, and beats Northwestern, why should Ohio State fans have confidence in, like you said, their old buddy Tom Herman in Texas to have a shot to beat Oklahoma? Besides the fact that, you know, Dicker the Kicker, our friend <laughs> from a few weeks ago, pulled it out for, for Texas the first time. Uh, well, again, in that Texas game, I mean, the Texas Oklahoma game earlier in the year, Texas was up by 21. Like, they were completely controlling that game. And, you know, Kyler Murray led him back because that's what Heisman candidates do, um, as we've seen with Haskins, who's also another Heisman candidate. But, I mean, rivalry games, you never know. Obviously, the best team doesn't always win. I think that was the case back in October when they played. Um, I think the line is, you know, only seven or so. So, I mean, it's not like Texas is a huge underdog in this game. Uh, Their defense is certainly better than Oklahoma's. You know, they held them to 24 points for about three and a half quarters when they played the first time. So, I mean, they've got some athletes over there. They need Sam Ellinger to, to not turn the ball over. Hopefully he's healthy enough to make enough plays. Um, and, you know, we'll see. And the good thing is that game's early, so Ohio State will know when they take the field if they just only need to win, do they need to win with style. You know, they'll, they'll have all of that under control, and they'll know well before game time. Yeah, 11 a.m. or noon or something Eastern, like that in yep. the Big 12 title game. So that'll be well out of the way by that point. All right, let's uh, kick it over now to some Big Ten title game talk. Got the Wildcats and now the Buckeyes after they dismantled Michigan like we like we touched on. On the surface, what jumps out at you in this matchup? Obviously, Ohio State's going to be favored. Um, what are some advantages that jump out to you, and, and are there any uh, in the case of Northwestern? Well, yeah, the Buckeyes are the biggest favorite in this uh, in the eight years that uh, we've had the title game. Uh, the previous uh, largest favorite was Wisconsin in year one, actually. I want to say they were a nine-and-a-half-point favorite over Michigan State, and that game was a classic, went down to the wire. 
Uh, Ohio State certainly has the advantage on paper, but this is kind of how Northwestern wants to be. I mean, they're, this is the eighth time this year that they've been an underdog, and that's crazy when you think about that, and they wound up winning their division by three games, and the fact that they won 15 in the last 16 Big Ten games. Don't really know exactly how they're doing it, but they just find ways to win. They don't sh- shoot themselves in the foot. You know, they're the least penalized team in the nation. I think the way that they have to win is to try to keep that Ohio State offense off the field. Um, unfortunately, the way that they play kind of fits with what Ohio State likes to do mm-hmm. defensively. Northwestern probably has to play a little bit more spread, I would think. They're, they don't have the athletes that Maryland has or Purdue has, but if you can spread them out and get those linebackers out of gaps, you got a better shot than what Michigan and Michigan State try to do, which is play them in a phone booth, and the better talent wins in that situation. Yeah, I was going to say, as so Northwestern played a team, even in their last two seasons where they've gone on this streak of winning 15 out of 16, have they played a team like Ohio State that likes to spread you out, like you said, and you know run all these crossing patterns and get it in the hands of their athletic receivers? Because I feel like <clears throat> Northwestern's biggest showings this year, it, like you said, it's been games in the phone, phone booth, like the narrow loss against Michigan, beating MSU. Um, I guess Nebraska is one of those teams that kind of spreads you out, and they gave them trouble. So what's a comp for a team that Northwestern has maybe faced recently, uh, similar to what they'll see on Saturday? Yeah, I don't know if there is a comp. I mean, you got you know, Heisman Kennedy, a quarterback with – you know, senior wide receivers with a ton of speed at the flank, and you got two really good running backs in the backfield. I mean, they're going to have to hope Ohio State gets, you know, turn it over. I mean, they had 12 penalties against Michigan. Maybe there's some self inflicted wounds there that Northwestern could try to take advantage of. I think the fact that the conditions will be perfect, you know, indoors, fast track isn't the, the best case scenario for them. But that's, that's a physical bunch on defense. You know, we've seen. You know, certain defensive ends like Willikis and Carter Coughlin get after Ohio State. And I think if you can put pressure on Haskins, make him a little uncomfortable uh, and, and mix in some, some zone coverages, I think that Northwestern could stay around. They have to take that first punch, though. If they get down 14 nothing, 17 nothing, and it becomes a pass rush drill, and it's a wrap. Yeah, that's what I was kind of saying to Dave um, when I sat with him and, and broke down the game. It just seems like when Ohio State finds that rhythm, then it's a wrap, like you said. But if they never really find their footing, kind of like in the game like uh, against Purdue or uh, other games we've seen them struggle, that's I mean, when the other team believes they're in it, and Ohio State just seems to kind of recoil a little bit. I don't know if you noticed that, but that's oh, kind of my sure. takeaway, especially from uh, the mental side of the game. Yeah, I mean, again, after I'd say after the Penn State game, I mean, we've seen them struggle for you know six weeks pretty much. I mean, you know, they barely even even the Penn State game, they barely got bad at one. They barely beat Nebraska. Uh, well, that Penn State game, they really didn't have any rhythm until they found it and clicked like out of nowhere in the fourth quarter. So, exactly, you know, just all up to to them when they decided to get it going. Right. I mean, lucky to beat Maryland. Lucky to beat Nebraska. I mean, the Michigan State game was nine six going to the fourth quarter. I just don't want last week's result against Michigan to cloud everything that we've seen before mm-hmm. that. Right. Like. That was a great performance. They put it all together on that one special night. They definitely have the talent to do that again, but I don't want to just assume that they're going to do it because they did it once. Uh, Northwestern, I think, is very fundamentally sound. They definitely got some good players on that defensive side of the ball. If they can try to control clock and not turn the ball over themselves and, again, take that first punch, I think they can stay in the game. All right, good analysis, H. And before we wrap up, I want to talk a little bit uh, Big Ten basketball, um, you know, we're right in the thick of it now, in the middle of the Big Ten ACC Challenge, so we won't have the full results of, of this week to talk about yet. We're, we're talking on Wednesday, but we do have a good idea of how uh, far the Big Ten has come, I think, at least from the last year and, and uh, the last couple of years, really, when the, the conference was down a little bit. So we're sitting here on Wednesday afternoon. The Big Ten is splitting so far with the ACC four games apiece. Big Ten has already won more games this year than they won in the previous challenge when they lost 11-3. to and also, they came into this week with seven teams ranked in the top 25, which is the most since 1999. So uh, I just want to get your general takeaways overall from uh, the Big Ten's, I guess, resurgence a little bit. Uh, is it as strong of a rebound as you know the seven ranked teams would indicate? And do you think they've performed, to this point, in the non-conference, uh, 
strong enough to you know indicate a, a nice showing once the selection committee huddles and, and puts together their field of 68. Uh, it's kind of like we talked a couple weeks ago. You know, you have to take you have to take care of your business during these holiday tournaments and in the challenge. We saw they won the Gavit games. You know, Wisconsin did good work in Atlantis. Uh, Michigan State won the Vegas tournament. You know, we saw Michigan win the Mohegan Sun tournament. You know, teams that were able to take care of their business, business get marquee wins. And if you just hold your own in the challenge, don't face plan on Wednesday. If you make it 8 6 7, seven or even win it, the way that they've done everything else leading up to the challenge sets themselves up to get six, seven, maybe even eight teams, which they've never they've never had eight uh, get in the tournament in a single year. This could be the year that that happens. It's a very deep league. Uh, I don't know if there's an elite team. Michigan might be. They definitely have the the elite defense. We'll see if the offense can match that. And obviously, we'll know more, uh, you know, after the Carolina game. But. Uh, with Michigan State losing, I don't know if there's an elite team in this league, but that I think that that makes the league race with 20 conference games even more fun because I wouldn't be shocked at all if the eighth or ninth team beat the one or the two team, you know, and it not even be considered an upset. Yeah, and the key, and we, we've touched on it multiple times, I think, is just getting to conference play with – a good amount of your teams in that top 30, 35 range. And, and just being on that bottom scroll, you know, top 25, having marquee matchups, at least from, uh, you know, on the surface uh, with the eye test. And that way, when voters see it, teams aren't knocked out because they lost a Wednesday night game against a Big Ten opponent because maybe that team's ranked in the top 25 and, and uh, you know, the, the losses just won't hurt as much. So I think teams like Ohio State being way better than expected, at least so far, and some of those middle of the pack teams that were, there were some heavy question marks surrounding them, proving that, yeah, they look pretty solid. They look tournament caliber, like Wisconsin, like Iowa. It's been a big deal. And, and like you said, I think as long as they don't face plant, I know we're dating ourselves, but if they don't face plant Wednesday night, I, I don't think you could ask for much better. Agree. And again, <clears throat> Penn State huge win beat Virginia mm-hmm. Tech. You know they had a two rough losses. So right, far. two rough yeah. losses. But it, you know Mike Watkins was back for the first mm-hmm. time, and we got to see his impact on the game. And to probably beat the third or fourth best team in, in the ACC, and Penn State's probably the ninth or tenth best team in this league. It just goes to show you how deep this league is. And you know, you see Iowa, you know, pound on Oregon and pound on UConn, and sort of come back against Pitt yesterday. So once you get all of these teams to get two conference play, as you mentioned, and then when they cannibalize each other, all of the wins can be looked at as quality wins, whereas last year it was like, oh, it's just a bunch of average teams beating each other up. Right. And that's how you only get four teams in a tournament. Right. So obviously we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, love college basketball at this time of year. And, uh, you know, that'll be top of mind. But biggest priority, we got a big game this weekend. And I will see you in Indy. It should be a fun time. And uh, Yeah, we'll, we'll see if – the expected happens and plays out, or we'll see if Northwestern can do what they do, hang around and, and maybe even win this thing. Yeah, I mean, I'll be I'll be curious to see what happens, and you know, Ohio State, I'm sure will be rooting for for Texas mm-hmm. very very hard, and and we'll see what happens at at eight o'clock Saturday night, and then the drama after the drama Sunday morning if Ohio State ends up winning. So exactly, we'll have our eyes on all of it. H, it's been a fun football season. Uh, we'll transition to hoops talk almost exclusively. Uh, in the next month or so, depending on how the Big Ten bowl matchups play out. But it's been a fun ride, and I'll see you in Indy. All right, sounds good, man. All right, thanks once again to Harold, J.A., and Dave for joining me. Really great episode. Uh, Three guys that have a lot of knowledge, a lot of insight, and who are a lot of fun to talk to, so appreciate them. And I appreciate everyone listening and uh, following along throughout this football season. Please continue to download the show, subscribe, and keep up with us as we move into bowl season, basketball season, and beyond. We'll have uh, guests you know, throughout, whether we're in season or not. We'll try and mix it up with athletes, coaches, reporters, anyone with a connection to Big Ten sports. Sometimes not, uh, but we uh, always try and make it interesting. So... Appreciate everyone out there for listening. Appreciate my producers, Wes White, Julie Bronder, who helped put this together every week, and assistant producer, Colleen Degnan, who helps me out. 
with the show as well. So thanks to everyone out there for listening, tuning in, and following along. And we'll talk to you next time here on the Take 10 Podcast.